So, um, to have an atelier, I mean, you know, one day uh, I was a student, I came out of, uh, of a school in Paris, I jumped into India, I reached the country, and suddenly I get this uh, enormous shock. Because in '93, that was the, uh, the opening of the country to the new economic policy, and uh, everybody was looking at India to be the second China. So I was sent to India to do a global study about the, on the opening of the Indian market to luxury brands. And I come into the country, and after a month of us running around the, 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 the different states and cities, I realized that there's no market for luxury brands in India in '93, which was quite surprising because uh, people often forget that in, at the beginning of the 20th century, Indian, uh, Indian elite was accounting for almost 50% of luxury purchase in Europe. If um, I have the chance to look at uh, the sales book of very old fashioned houses in Paris between 1920 and 35, and every two lines you have uh, uh, an Indian client uh, buying uh, luxury products. So in 93, I come here, I said, wow, I mean, that's going to be difficult to sell uh, luxury products in this uh, country. But what I realized immediately is that uh, India, who was famous for selling $1 t-shirts to America and other countries, had this enormous talent and craft everywhere. I mean, anywhere I would go through the country, I would see only exceptional craft. And I immediately told myself, but how is it possible that people come to this country to do $1 t-shirts where they should be doing the most exceptional objects, I mean, the most exceptional products of the world? So, that's how it started, actually. It started, I would say, that I, by, uh, you know, almost like, a, it was almost like a mistake, you know. I didn't come to India for this, but suddenly I realized that this is the potential of the country. So, I had the chance of uh, going back to, uh, to Paris, um, I was working with a very, very talented uh, French designer called Azedin Alaya and I spoke to Mr. Alaya about what I just saw in India and I told Azedin, uh, this, is a, this is an embroidery done in 93 for Mr. Alaya. Uh, I told to Azedin, um, you know Azedin, I think we need to rethink the way craft is done in Europe because already in 93 the, the cost of craft was so expensive in Europe that it was just a very small elite that could afford that craft. And I had this, this vision that craft should become more global in terms of luxury products. So I was quite lucky because um, Azedin, who was a specialist of knitwear, this is a, a knit uh, fabric, um, this is the dress that you just saw the, the detail. Uh, Azedin told me, you know what, just take some piece of fabrics go to India and start researching. So I came back to the country and I started researching, experimenting. So that's what I call the initial process research of uh, my career, where for four years I just kept researching, um, uh, trying, experimenting, lots of disappointments, as uh, you all can imagine, because uh, what you have in your mind doesn't automatically translate on the reality. But you know, what I could see was that this incredible craft that people were able to do. So, I came back to Paris, we started doing uh, some simple embroideries uh, for the Alaya brand, and uh, I started collaborating with, uh, with different brands. Then, immediately, in, the, in, in about a span of four to five years, I realized that if I was able to not only embroider but also print, block print, tie and dye and basically addition all these know-hows, okay, we would be able to manufacture products that nobody else is able to do. So that became really my complete obsession. Uh, I was obsessed by the fact that India was at par with any European countries. Okay? And I really wanted to demonstrate and to show to um, French people and Italian people, okay, I'm half uh, Italian, half French, as my name can uh, show a little bit. And uh, I really, you know, I really had this obsession, very stubborn, I kept coming back and going back to Europe, telling people, you know, I'm sorry, but India is exactly at par with the level of quality of what you do. 
So you can imagine the kind of uh, faces that people were doing at that time, okay? Because they, they, they thought I was really crazy. Okay. But, uh, you know, when you have, it comes a moment where you, you really have this confidence and you believe in the fact that what you do is right, okay? You think it's going to take five years, then you think it's going to take 10 years, then you think it's going to take 15 years. Actually, it took 20 years. Okay, but that's a time of India, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I always said that you should never underestimate the time it takes to do things in India, even today. So, uh, 26 years later, <laughs> Les Ateliers to have, okay, we are, um, I would say, pretty, uh, pretty uh, there on the fashion scene because we are the production partners of uh, what I consider world's uh, luxury, biggest and luxury brand, which is Hermes. We work for Hermes, we work for Chanel, we work for Christian Dior, we work for a lot of uh, also smaller brands because I believe that what you do with the biggest brands should also help smaller brands to come up. So today we uh, we uh, we manage. Uh, uh, I would say five production points in the country, and these five production production points, each one has a speciality. So, if the client wants to do only embroidery, he will do embroidery in Bombay. If the client wants to do uh, printing and tie and dye, he will work out of our Jaipur factory. If he wants to do manufacturing, it's from uh, North Bombay uh, production. So the idea is really to addition all these know-hows in order to be able to offer the uh, client like uh, a menu on which he will choose the kind of uh, knowledge and know-how he needs from uh, the country to integrate into the design of the product that they want to do. This is a very interesting uh, product. This is a, a bag for Hermes. It's our first bag for Hermes. Okay, this is the first one, this is the last one. This is the one which is right now in the stores. If you go to Paris, Hong Kong, or New York, you will find the zigzag bolid. And this one was the first one. It's called the Garden Craft. So this one was really a challenge for us because it was the first time that suddenly, okay, world's biggest luxury brands decides to do one full bag in India. I need to tell you a story about Hermes and its relation to India because one would think, oh, Hermes is coming to India because they want cheaper prices and good labor and all that. That's not the story. 1964, the, uh, the man who transformed Hermes into what it is today, uh, Jean-Louis Dumas, is the uh, founding, uh, from the founding family. Jean-Louis Dumas came to India taking his car from Paris and drove down all the way up to Ahmedabad. Family was very friend with the Sarabai family in, uh, in Ahmedabad. So he came to spend the summer, summer 1964, in India. And um, happened what should happen, because either you hate it, either you love it, okay? So Mr. Dumas fell in love with India. So from 1964, Mr. Dumas came on a very regular basis to India almost every summer to spend the time in Ahmedabad with his friends, the Sarabais, and then he would travel around the country to discover the beauty of, uh, of the country. So that's 1964. Since his first trip, he already in 1964 noticed the craft of the country. But he was busy doing other things and he didn't really know how to, I would say, enter the, uh, the craft uh, sector in India. And the brand in 1964 was much, much smaller, okay? Today it's a 5 billion uh, euros brand. In 1964, it's a 40 million uh, euros uh, brand. So you see the, the difference of scale. Um, 1964, I met Mr. Dumas in 1996. So that's almost 30, it's 32 years later. Uh, 32 years later, uh, Jean-Louis Dumas um, I'm having dinner with Jean-Louis Dumas and Mr. Alaya, and uh, Mr. Dumas saw the embroideries that I took back from uh, India for Mr. Alaya. And he said, wow, I really would love to have a painting embroidered for the store in Paris. Okay? So if, if you've seen the images of the Hermes store in uh, Faubourg, uh, 
uh, Saint Laurent in Paris, okay, it's, there's a lot of windows, and there's a corner window which is uh, quite iconic. And uh, Mr. Dumas told me, okay, I would love to have uh, a, a painting embroidered for this corner uh, window. So that's how the relation with Hermès started. It's 1996. We did this painting embroidery. He was extremely happy with it. And uh, we kept doing pieces for just decorating the windows. So what's very interesting with Hermès is that the time of Hermès is almost like the time of India. So 96, 97, 98, 99, blah, 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 blah. Okay, for 10 years, we just did special pieces for win the windows. Then, you know, in my mind, I thought, that guy is crazy. That guy is really crazy. He's doing all these products for the windows and he's not selling a single one. So we would do scarves, we would do bags, huh? and nothing was for sale. You know, and in my mind, I was thinking, but does he realize that the entire world would like to buy this kind of products? So, 2005, I said, but Mr. Dumas, don't you think we maybe could do one scarf for the stores? <laughs> and then he said, mm, yeah, that's not a bad idea. Let's do one scarf. <laughs> wow. I said, such a large brand, okay, they're not thinking of doing one scarf. So, but it's because in the Hermes time of creation, things do come naturally. Okay? And this house is really different from all the, the other luxury houses. That's why I want, I want to tell you this story because you will understand where, where, where we're coming from. And uh, so in, in 2005 we did one scarf. And we did 100 pieces of that scarf. Knowing that the store, uh, the, the brand at that time had 277 stores, okay, 100 scarf means that there was one scarf every three stores. Okay. I said, okay, he's not taking a big risk, but maybe he doesn't believe in the product. <laughs> so, okay. well, happened what had to be happened. Okay, we delivered the 100 scarves. Six days later, there's no more scarves in the network. <laughs> okay, I think that you know, we could have expected this kind of reaction. So, that's how it started with Hermès, because then suddenly Mr. Dumas said, wow, that's amazing. Okay, we're going to do two scarves. <laughs> <laughs> tell you is that we are in 2019 uh, and the collection that we do for Hermes, which is called the Exceptional Collection and that carries a Made in India label, okay, because they are extremely proud of the Made in India label, okay, that uh, Exceptional Collection has grown like this since the last 14 years. It means that, okay, one scarf more, one product more, maybe we try one thing more, okay, slowly, we go slowly, we go slowly, we don't take any risk, we go slowly, okay. The result is today in 2019, you go to the stores, okay, the product comes in and the, uh, the lifespan of any of the products of the exceptional collection in the Hermes store is 12 days. Wow. So, it shows that, you know, I love this, this, this beauty that this brand has to understand that if this takes 350 hours to manufacture, it takes 350 hours. It cannot take 270 hours. And this is the beauty is that this brand understands the entire craft process of India. It, we can really say that in the world of luxury, Hermès is a complete uh, different brand, okay? They don't follow any of the rules of any of the other luxury brands. Another exceptional brand is Chanel. Chanel uh, is at par with Hermès in terms of quality um, level. It means that uh, today the two most, for me, high level quality brands of luxury are Hermes and Chanel. Both are uh, all the other brands in terms of quality level, quality control and quality systems are much lower. So basically this is what we do here um, from our Bombay office. Well, I always say that we are the, uh, uh, the conductor of a huge orchestra where we try to have everybody to, uh, to play uh, together in order to reach uh, that music that will help uh, make uh, the, the products and deliver those products. 
And of course, what is also very important is that you need to, uh, in, in our job, you need to, to understand what the designer on the other side of the world is telling you. Okay, so um, when, uh, uh, when uh, the uh, artistic director of uh, Schiaparelli explains you that he wants this uh, 1960s uh, floral dress, uh, Roman style, blah, 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 okay, you need to very fast go and search and understand the images, understand what he is looking at, and then understand how to translate that into a physical uh, creation. This is what we do, um, this is what we try to, uh, to promote, this is, uh, I mean, if I'm here today, is to show people that uh, anything is possible in this country. Um, you need a lot of, uh, you need a lot of uh, perseverance, of course, I mean, if there's one word that uh, you need in the country for anything, is perseverance. <laughs> But, um, but, you know, I really feel, you know, every, I, I was telling Amishi, I mean, it's, it's such a pity that we have only 24 hours a day, because, uh, you know, you could be in Srinagar, you could be in Varanasi, you could be in South, you could be in Butch, uh, there's so much to do. Uh, uh, I always say that the craft, uh, craft of, um, uh, the craft of Kashmir is one of the most exceptional crafts of India. And it's such a pity that the political situation uh, freezes a bit what is possible in that state, because really uh, some of their crafts are unique. Usually the crafts that you can find in the country are available in multiple places. But some of the crafts that you will find in Kashmir are available only in Kashmir. So it's really a pity because there's so commercial potential and development and doors that could be open for those artisans which at the moment are frozen. And after, after so many years in India, uh, what I realized, I said, hmm, how come a country which has almost 300 fashion schools doesn't have a single school for uh, artisans? A real school, you know, like uh, you get up uh, at 8, at 8.30, at 9, you start the school <laughs> at 9 until 6 o'clock. <laughs> Uh, why, why I'm saying that? Because basically what I did for 15 years is that I educated and I trained the artisans to reach the level of quality that was required to make those products. Okay? I mean, when you look at all the, the products I show you, it seems very easy. Actually, it's extremely complicated. So if the production process and the quality process is not permanently in place, it cannot guarantee that you deliver to, uh, to the final client the perfect product which is required. And so how do you maintain that quality standard? <coughs> so um, in 2014, actually it started in 2013, uh, I said we need to set up school. Okay, I cannot just spend my time in the factories to train and educate people and then, you know, we, it's not part of our job. We are doing the school and then we're doing the employer. We need to separate the things. So um, that's how the, the idea of uh, Calat was born. Uh, I said we need to establish a school where we will give a proper one year education to uh, artisans. So again, a lot of uh, perseverance <laughs> because I thought it was uh, easier to open a school in India but actually it's even more complicated than opening a company. <laughs> <laughs> So it took, it took us three years from the moment I decided to the moment we, uh, we opened. Okay. So, but you know, it's good that it took three years it, because then you have the time to, to think. Uh, one of my fears was to say, wow, again, again another, another crazy man who's going to open a trust in the country. The country has already uh, one crore trust doing uh, X, Y, Z. So what are we going to do with uh, this trust? So we sent an anthropologist uh, through, uh, through the country uh, to inquire what characters and artisans really need. Uh, because I said, maybe we're going to get it wrong. Okay? We need to understand what they need before we open a school. So we went through all this uh, survey uh, through the country. And basically, after, after almost uh, six months of survey, it was, uh, I mean, the two major points that were consistent from north, south, east, and west were two points. First thing is that artisans are extremely proud of the knowledge that 
they've acquired through their environment or families, but they don't get the recognition that they feel they don't get the recognition that they deserve. That was the first point. Second point is very easy, is that they don't get paid the right amount of money that they should be paid. Okay. So, uh, I went to, to search for a, a director for the institute and um, uh, I asked uh, uh, Jaspal Kara came on board and uh, Jaspal has a, has a, has a PhD from, uh, from NIFT and um, we, we said how can we impact the lives of these artisans? How can we really make a difference and not just say that, oh, we've done something and now we feel better. And, no, how can we really change their lives so that there's a pre-entry to the school and then there's a post-school. Uh, so uh, before opening the school, we did uh, some small modules. So why did I choose Lucknow? That's uh, usually a question that people ask me. So why did I choose Lucknow? Why did I go to Lucknow? Uh, people forget that uh, what we call the modern embroidery, okay? The institute is dedicated to embroidery. I forgot to say that, okay? It was, it was difficult to open an institute where we, we would do block printing, blah, 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 and all the craft. No, I had to start it from somewhere. Uh, so, uh, we started from embroidery because this is one of the craft that uh, we, uh, we cherish the most. And um, why Lucknow? Uh, uh, essentially two reasons. There's an historical reason to Lucknow. Uh, people often forget that uh, uh, the, court, the court of Agra and Uttar Pradesh is where the modern Indian embroidery was born. So it was impo important for me to go back to historical the region where the embroidery that you see all over the country was really born. Um, do we have time to do a two minutes historical thing? Okay, because people don't know the history of India uh, of embroidery in India usually. Okay, uh, uh, that modern embroidery is not Indian; it's Persian. So uh, it came it came from Persia, but before coming from Persia, it came from Constantinople from Istanbul, from Byzance. But before coming from Byzance, the first embroidered dress, it's very interesting, first embroidered dress is an Egyptian dress. And uh, why, uh, why the, the, the pharaoh would use embroidery is they would use this very small uh, sequence of gold to reflect the sun on their uh, body and appearance. So it was for them, embroidery would become the way to, to make them uh, gods. So that was really the element so that they would be in public, that reflection of light would say that, wow, we are, we are the gods, we are really different from the rest of the, the, the population. And it's very interesting because historically, embroidery is going to always be that. that. Uh, so from, from the... Uh, from 3,000 years, that dress is 2,600 years huh, before Christ. So from 3,000 years before Christ up to the 16th century, okay, to the royal court of France, okay, embroidery is what is going to make the difference between the aristocracy and the rest of the population. If you cannot afford embroidery, if you cannot afford these ex very expensive crafts, which embroidery was one of, Okay, it means you don't belong to the aristocracy. So the, the, it's, a, it's a very interesting point because now we jump to 2019. Today, because my belief is that embroidery will always be the element of craft that will differentiate luxury products from all the rest. So today technology is so powerful that when you honestly, when you see a Zara garment or you see a Uniqlo garment, especially Uniqlo, okay, these Japanese are really crazy. So, uh, and when I say they're really crazy because a white shirt made by Uniqlo is so exceptional in terms of quality and you look at the price and you really shake your head to figure out how they made, uh, you take a Christian Dior shirt and you take a Uniqlo shirt, it's exactly the same quality of stitching. Okay, uh, one is 39 euros, the other one is about 990 euros. <laughs> <laughs> so we know why luxury brands are making such heavy profits right now. <laughs> so, um, 
Embroidery is really UP, okay, uh, unfortunately for you guys, <laughs> UP is the center of the craft excellence in India. UP is the only state where we find all the crafts from uh, carpet making to glass, uh, from uh, metal to uh, silk, from embroidery to perfume, everything is available in UP. So it was very important for me to start with from, uh, from uh, Latno because everybody would have expected me to start from Jaipur, you know? And I always said that, you know, everybody always leaves from Delhi and goes on to the right to Jaipur, but the hidden gem of India is actually on the left and it's Lucknow. So I wanted to attract a little bit of attention to Lucknow. So that's how uh, the institute started, setting up a team, setting up, um, uh, uh, setting up, then one of the challenge was uh, to recruit the people, okay? So who, you, who, who are you going to recruit? Who are you going to interview? Uh, how is it going to happen, you know? So we had to figure out all uh, these uh, questions, which was not easy, but then you take, uh, you know, you take uh, decisions. So this is a little bit uh, how we are uh, organized. Uh, uh, we set up an advisory board, which I think is very uh, important. And we have two courses. We have a craft innovation and entrepreneurship, which is really dedicated to Zardozi artisans. And we have what we call the Sangra Embroidery and Product Design, which is dedicated to this particular craft of Lucknow, which is the chicken embroidery. One important thing um, for me was, from the beginning, it was, uh, um, it was part of uh, the decision. I said, uh, if, not, if you want artisans to really concentrate and really get involved and really get educated, you need to uh, give them the money to come to the school, okay? Because they don't have any options. They don't have uh, money in the bank deposit to say, oh, I'm going to take a one year off and uh, I'm going to come to, uh, to the school. That, that's not possible. So I said, okay, how can we get them to quit their jobs for one year and come to... So, of course, you have, you have to find a way to, uh, uh, to create a remuneration. So, um, Jaspal came up with this idea of credits, and each credit uh, is 15 hours of contact, and basically it was 15 hours equivalent to uh, 1,500 uh, rupees per credit. So, the, uh, the budget that will be allocated for one year per artisan is one lakh. So, one lakh is the maximum money that that artisan can earn at the institute over, uh, I know, when I say one year, actually it's nine months. Okay, it's not exactly one year. It, there's a little bit of breaks in between because uh, otherwise we realize that artisans which are not used to study, uh, after a certain amount of time, if we go too intense, okay, they, uh, they just disconnect. So we had to, to create a, a kind of planning that was suitable for them to, uh, to learn, to experiment, then go back home, do some homework, and then come back. Uh, basically, this is what they have to do. Okay, so I'm not going to read it. I can send it to you if you want. We can send you the full program if you're interested. Okay, the, I think the curriculum is very, uh, is very interesting in terms of uh, challenging the artisan. Okay, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not only about the, the craft and the embroidery, but it's also about the design, it's also about the environment, it's also about uh, how to, how to be uh, health, healthy in their own lives. Um, here you have some pictures uh, taken, uh, you have some pictures taken at the institute uh, four months ago, uh, because we, um, um, I wanted to, one, one, after those nine months of studies, I wanted to be able to confront the artisan with artists. It was very important for me, um, now go back to history, 16th, in the 16th century, uh, everybody knows that Michelangelo was doing paintings, Raphael was doing paintings. What people often forget is that Michelangelo and Raphael designed, um, uh, designed uh, sketches for embroideries. And embroidery at the Renaissance was considered at the same level as doing a painting or... Uh, so but what they would call the tapestry work 
in the, which could be embroidered, which could be woven, okay, depending on the craft they would use, was a common medium used by artists to, uh, to create. So um, I, said, uh, I said to Jasper, uh, we need to create an artist residency program within the institute. Because once they've done these nine months of studies, we need to challenge them with confronting what they believe and what they learn with a totally different point of view. So we, uh, we started the first uh, artist residency last uh, November, so it's very recent. And the first artist that I invited to Lugno is uh, T. Benkana. And uh, I knew that Benkana would be interested by the medium. So we invited him to come for a month at the Institute. And I had no expectations from, uh, from that. And actually what happened during that month of November, beginning of December 2018, was really, uh, was really exceptional. Uh, here you have a view of some of the works which were in process during that artist residency. And um, it, really challenged the, it really challenged the artisans because the subjects that Denkana would use would be completely against the belief of uh, those artisans. So it was very interesting to see how the artist and the artisan would communicate and how the artist came, the, uh, uh, took the artisans to approve the fact of the subject of representation of a human body, naked people and all that. I mean, you know, the first time they had to design a naked woman, the artisans, they put down the needle and the hook and they said, no, we cannot do it. I said, okay, Avenkara, I think you need to go and speak with them. And, you know, he spoke with them and he explained them what is, a, 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 what is an artist concept. And so they understood what he was explaining and they decided that they were allowed to do it. So it was very interesting to see the belief of the artisan, the vision of the artist coming together. And um, uh, I don't know if you guys saw the exhibition at Galerie Mascara on uh, 16th of uh, January, because basically uh, the eight, uh, eight art, uh, art pieces came out of uh, this uh, residency and were exhibited in Bombay on, um, during the Mumbai uh, Gallery Weekend, uh, January uh, 16th and happened something that never happened to Abe Mascara in his uh, 10 years of uh, gallery uh, in India, is that the, the exhibition got sold out in 72 hours. So it was very interesting to see people's reaction to these artworks, because um, we would have never expected, first, that something would happen in Lagno, second, that a gallery would love it, Third, that international collectors okay, would just buy the pieces without even seeing them in Rio. So um, uh, I was a bit disappointed because I wanted to bring those uh, eight pieces to Europe to show people what was possible in India. So that was not possible. The pieces uh, left uh, for the, each destination. And um, I, uh, Benkana just came back now to Lucknow. I said, Benkana, we need to do another <laughs> exhibition. So uh, again, the artisans are working with the artists right now to create another series of, uh, of work. Then uh, we have, uh, so the, the Institute has a, a heritage center, as an incub incubation center, that for me is very, very important. It means that we need to identify the, among the, the students, we need to identify the ones who, who will be to become leaders and who are able to then create their own units and able to uh, employ the, the other ones. So we need to identify those ones and we need to incubate them within the institute and give them the, uh, not only the financial resources but also the marketing and management resources to set up their own company. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>